Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Mary Ducharme, founder of Natural Transitions Consulting. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all who have joined today's webinar, especially fellow HRSA recipients and those from our Southwest region. We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous people. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Since 2011, the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center has partnered with the Arizona Telemedicine Program to bring you over 185 informative webinars. As you join the webinar today, your microphone was muted. Please use the chat function of Zoom to ask questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access on demand from our website at telemedicine.arizona edu forward slash webinars forward slash previous. The URL is listed on this slide and we also post the URL in the chat. It is, it is my pleasure to introduce today's panelists. Mary Ducharme is founder and president of Natural Transitions Consulting. Ms. Ducharme brings over 20 years of occupational therapy experience focusing on home health, durable medical equipment, residential, group homes, schools, and traumatic brain injury, both inpatient and outpatient and support. She also has 15 years engineering experience, both bioengineering and auto industry. William Medina is Leeds Plus Advisor at City University of New York, Bronx Community College. Mr. Medina oversees the assistive technology at Bronx Community College and is a Lighthouse Guild Saturday Youth Transition Program technology instructor. He has presented with Lehman College at the CUNY Accessibility Conference at John Jay College and served as panelists at Columbia University Assistive Tech Seminar at Liam College on the addressing the needs of a diverse learning community and at Lehman College Bronx Disability Employment Expo. And thirdly, Ken Smith II is founder and chief experience officer or CXO for NextGen AT. Mr. Smith facilitated the development and growth of two remote support and assistive technology vendors. He sits on the Ohio Report Support Remote Supports Waiver Revision Committee and serves as a board member for PAR Ohio, standing for Professionals, Advocates, and Resources. He is the founder of Ability Tech an assistive technology consulting firm and also co-founded NextGen AT, a turnkey remote support platform developed for the local provider agency. Hi, this is Mary Ducharme, uh, occupational therapist, assistive technology professional and um, a background in bioengineering. Today, our learning objectives are, will include to learn about RESNA. RESNA stands for Rehab Engineering Society of North America, which, and it has two free special interest groups if you wanna um, be involved and in, 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 in kind of be a guest in it before you join. And uh, the two free and special interests is the international group serving underserved areas and posture 24 seven, which addresses posture not only during the day, but at night to reduce scoliosis. Uh, Resna has several standardization groups. I'm on the committee for um, cognitive accessibility and the other committees include uh, wheelchairs, golf carts, um, wheelchair and transportation, uh, seating and positioning, and uh, surfaces. And so there's there are several committees, and then I'm also going to talk about. Um, the new assistive technology products and services and medical software 
useful for three non-conflictual parties on group three wheelchairs. And on our second learning objectives, we're gonna talk about smart home devices and how they can be applied and help with medical monitoring. And third, um, learn about remote support systems for people with intellectual disabilities. Sensors are positioned in the client's home, so previously dependent clients can be monitored remotely to be safe. Um, I'm honored to be able to discuss the uh, current um, air, area of assistive technology with the Arizona Telemedicine Program. Thank you very much for inviting me. I educate service providers. It's a diverse group, including um, direct care providers, education, uh, rehabilitation providers, advocacy clients, humanitarian NGOs, and durable medical equipment suppliers. Here's a picture of the virtual classroom, which is um, COVID related and um, assistive technology got a big push in the education arena from the public health emergency. But it's only one performance area. The other performance areas include work, community, and home. Assistive technology devices are devices that are used um, when an individual cannot complete an activity independently, but can be modified independent with the assistive technology. The assistive technology devices are reusable. They are not disposable. Hold on a minute. Assistive, I, I teach an assistive technology fundamentals course. Resna also teaches it and other DME companies teach it um, to prepare you for the ATP, to help prepare you for the ATP certification test. The ATP certification is now worldwide. It's recognized worldwide because um, Resna took out all the legislation and, and funding was already taken out. So there's no legislation questions and no funding questions on the ATP certification test. So it can be recognized worldwide. My, my reference was Joe McKnight, who was heavily involved with Resna, and he works for Senior Mobility Aids. The ATP implementation plan has five broad areas that are broken down into sequential steps of the plan. Um, assessment of need in, includes the HAT model, which means human activity assistive technology um, model with a contextual environment of being um, wor the work area, the community, home, and education. Um, we take in the intake um, involves collecting a the stakeholders in the, it's a client focused um, model and it takes the stake, it includes all stakeholders and um, it includes therapy evaluations like from the physical therapist or an occupational therapist. Um, also the physician, the, P, the primary care physician is usually notified if insurance funding um, is required and also for um, certain types of wheelchairs. Uh, development, then we develop the intervention strategy, which includes um, procure, uh, procurement, no, development. Um, That is when you're working with the, the stakeholders um, and trying to find the exact need and um, trial and error. Um, you can trial equipment. Uh, each state agency, each state has an agency um, statewide that you can consult with or borrow equipment from like a loaning library and 
also several DME companies have wheelchairs or equipment available, bath equipment. You can't really trial that, but but we try to trial as many as we can and um, kind of look at the uh, what's available in the environment and kind of merge that inclusively if we can, especially with education. Um, and uh, and you use past experiences of use and try to develop from there. The implementation involves procurement and assembly of the assistive technology devices and um, drafting out a safety plan and scheduling a follow-up um, for the evaluation of intervention, which includes the client, it's very client-focused model and the stakeholders that need to know how to use the equipment safely, how to maintain it, and how to and when to call when there are problems in a follow-up calendar. Um, professional conduct, of course, um, is like outlined in the Resna website. And based, on, I want, I just wanted to point out that if you have something that you think is out of your wheelhouse, like perhaps a uh, sensory impairment, such as hearing and vision, you refer to another professional that for that issue. Okay, I'm gonna discuss class three wheelchairs. They're also called group three. Um, uh, there was a expert panel in 2006 uh, that CMS hired and to re-categorize all the wheelchairs. Um, actually, in this one article I read, it was, it's four groups, but there are actually six groups. There, um, the first group is very basic um, power wheelchair used in assisted living facilities and institutions not designed for home use. There are only 29 of those, 29 different models. And the group two wheelchairs are, there are 366 models and those are used mostly in the home or on occasional use, uh, not, um, not all the time. A group three wheelchairs are used 12 to 18 hours in, in basically when the client is out of bed, the client is using that wheelchair. And group four wheelchairs, um, are um, for uneven terrain. Also, it includes bariatric, so heavy duty and extra heavy duty wheelchairs. Um, those are power wheels. These are all power wheelchairs. And then group five is, um, I, know what, I can't remember what group five is, but group six is the pediatric wheelchairs with growth with a growth kit so that you can change as a, as a person grows, you can re-engineer it and change it. But the three-party collaborative intervention is required on all class three wheelchairs. Oh, the other one I wanted to mention was the ultralight wheelchairs, which are for active wheelchair users. That's K5, K5, yeah. Um, but those are power, are manual wheelchairs, but complex manual wheelchairs, and some of them are made of titanium, so they easily get into the car. Um, okay, and on class three wheelchairs, you have to have a ramp or a lift to get it into the car. On class two wheelchairs, some of them can be put in the boot of the car. Um, class two wheelchairs also, some of them have a seating, a basic seating mobility power function, such as recline or tilt and space. A tilt and space is used for pressure relief, and it's basically you um, tilt the entire chair assembly 
so that the back isn't isn't reclined, it, but the entire assembly reclined it is tilted, and it's used for pressure relief and also to reduce spasticity. Um, the reclined function is used for hygiene and bladder control, but the reclined function can cause stress on the skin. So, um, so you have to balance that out. Um, the three-party collaborative intervention is required on class three and the class two that have the seating mobility power options. Um, and that includes the DME vendor, which, which is required that an ATP is on staff, a physician um, with a face-to-face -face exam. And I have this software here, PMDRX, um, that will help the physician you use that software so to reduce denials and um, not to have to repeat this all over again in a therapist evaluation, all non-conflictual. Resin also certifies seating and mobility, and, which is an advanced um, certification after the ATP and then um, rehab engineering technology um, providers. CRT stands for Complex Rehab Technology, where so generally when you have a class three wheelchair, it is you have a neurological condition or a congenital skeletal condition or, or um, uh, myopathy and um, it, it, it's complex. You can also have a rheumatic rheumatoid arthritis or multiple amputees, but it's a complex situation. Um, there are two associations involved, NERTS and NCART. Um, NERTS is for the suppliers and NCART is for the clinicians. And they're heavily, Unite for CRT is also a support group that started this year for people with CRT um, to get together once a month. And that is under NERTS. Um, umbrella. And these two agencies are heavily involved with legislation. Today, um, we had an ask with Congress. Um, we had 42 out of 50 states involved. And I personally had six representatives and what, three from West Virginia and three from Montana. And the ask, we had three asks. The, one, the first ask was seat elevation and standing option on that CMS would provide reimbursability um, because it's both for active reach and for standing. Um, typically you'd had another device that was called a stander and you would have to transfer before you would have to transfer from that wheelchair to the stander and then transfer back. So typically that was only done once a day. Well, if the stander is on the wheelchair, it can be done several times a day, increasing weight bearing and, and bodily function. The second ask was um, to help the suppliers, especially during COVID. Um, they have extra costs and there's a competitive bid and that's how they get paid. So we were trying to reduce the competitive bid so that the suppliers are getting um, more payment because we're losing suppliers. And the third ask is for the occupational therapists and physical therapists to um, permanently be able to use Telenet for assistive technology evaluations, it, which is allowed during the public emergency. And finally, um, I'm going to mention um, medical wearables, um, such as activity trackers, pacemakers, Holter, um, Holter monitors, sky's the limit, and um, collecting the data. And when the person does a telenet um, conversation with the physician, you need a secure download and that's called blockchain for so for HIPAA compliance and um, for uh, confidentiality. And then biometrics is a personal identification which includes um, 
fingerprint, facial recognition, et cetera, for further um, safety. And that's called the Holy Trinity and more can be learned on the splash link. Now I'm gonna introduce William Medina, Assistant Director of Assistive Technology at Bronx CUNY, and he is gonna discuss smart home services. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mary, for that presentation. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. As Mary said, my name is William Medina. I, I manage the assistive, assistive technology at Bronx Community College, aside from running a few other programs. And, um, and I want to apologize um, ahead of time. Uh, my camera is currently off because I am at work. Um, and it's a college campus and um, students might be in my frame. Um, I'm really excited about this topic um, because it's helping individuals with disabilities um, live at home independently. So um, as far as smart homes and smart devices, there are lots of examples. We, there are wearables, there are safety devices, uh, smart speakers and smart displays like uh, most popular Google Home set of products, uh, Amazon Echo or Alexa set of products. And they, they help individuals create, out, create areas um, to hang out, chill out um, for leisure time and help them communicate with the world. So as far as wearables go, uh, uh, the most popular device out there is probably the, the Apple Watch. Um, it, although it's, it's, it's created for, for conventional use, it, it definitely is capable of loading up apps that will help people with disabilities, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, there are also devices such as uh, medical monitors um, that help um, healthcare providers uh, monitor patients and, and um, um, clients. Um, for example, most recently, um, my my wife not too long ago she she um, noticed um, an irregular heartbeat. So after communicating with her doctor, her doctor had her wear a heart monitor, which was paired with a smartphone, which the doctor also provided for seventy two hours. It allowed the doctor to to monitor her heart for for 70, 72 hours, and her life was not disrupted, which was very um, convenient. There are certain apps such as Habit Aware, which help individuals um, deal with their, their habits. Um, for example, for individuals that are constantly pulling or, or twirling their, their hair, um, it could notify them that they're doing it because often individuals don't notice they're doing it. And hopefully that, that'll serve as a deterrent from doing it again. There are certain headphones out there um, that have built-in sensors that allow them to, to um, keep track of you know, the distance that you've walked or run and also mon monitor your, your heartbeat. Aside from, from um, smart devices as, as those that I just spoke of, there are also devices that are um, good for safety. For example, modern alarm systems um, are Obviously, they could detect when a, a door or a window is open and closed, but they could they could also notify a third party concerning it, um, and could also have um, audible sounds to to allow the individual at home know that a door or window was opened or closed, which is very useful for individuals that are uh, a run risk. There are sensors for beds that uh, will detect the smallest amount of moisture and could either notify the person that's sleeping that they're, they're about to wet the bed and hopefully they'll wake up and go use the bathroom or notify a third party, which um, they could, um, are, able, are then able to come into the room and, and assist the, the person in bed. There are doorbell, smart doorbells out there. Um, for example, um, most popular right now is um, Amazon's Ring doorbells and, and the Nest Hello doorbells, which have built-in cameras, built-in microphones, built-in speakers. Um, they could, when the doorbell is rung, they could uh, notify the individuals at home, notify a third party, um, and notify users remotely through, through their smartphone. And then they're able to communicate with whoever's at the door through, through their smartphone or on another device like a, like a smart display 
and and then um, decide whether they're going to let the individual in or um, in or not. And in certain situations, if you have a, a smart lock, you could also unlock the door and just let the individual in. You could strategically place cameras um, both around the home and inside the home, um, which is very useful when you have clients that are that are run risk, so you could keep stay aware of what's going on in the home. There are also sensory beds. Um, the probably the most popular right now is the uh, one of the models of the sleep number bed, which could detect restlessness and um, depending on the, the smart devices that are at, uh, at home through if this, then that technology, um, it could either um, turn off the lights if the lights are still on, change the thermostat to a more comfortable temperature, play some, um, some, some sounds on, the, on, the smart, on a smart speaker to, to, to calm them. And then we also have smart lighting. Um, the, the most popular um, product out is probably Philips, um, the Philips U set of products, um, which you could definitely turn on and off, like um, just like any other conventional light bulb, but you could also um, turn them on and off remotely if you so wish. You could set them on a timer to turn on or off at a certain time. Um, for example, uh, in my home, uh, the lights in my room are set to to brighten slowly 30 starts brightening slowly 30 minutes before the alarm goes off and by the time the alarm goes off the the bowls are at full brightness and hopefully <laughs> it wakes me up it doesn't always work um it and you can also set them up with um to respond to other devices or or, or sensors um for example um, have the porch lights or and the foyer lights turn on when when the when a car pulls up in, in the driveway, or or even um, have certain sense motion detectors around the house, maybe in a in a dark hallway or or along some steps, and have it turn on the lights when it detects a person walking, which will help prevent accidents. And of course. Uh, a lot of devices are, are used commonly for, for leisure today. For example, um, streaming devices such as the Google Chromecast set of devices or the Amazon um, Fire Stick um, set of devices, which of course you could use it to, to stream things like Netflix, HBO Max, and so on and so forth. But you can also um, control it um, in conventional ways with, um, with a remote control or um, through your smartphone, which is convenient for, for certain individuals. And, and even remotely, um, a third party could, could turn on or off um, uh, a TV or, or change the channel if, if they so wish. And of course, you could control them through your smart speaker and your, your smart displays also. And it helps you create more comfortable spaces um, and it could even um, be set up with routines with your smart speaker. For example, um, you could set it up so that if you tell the smart speakers um, to switch to relax mode, maybe the lights are dim, um, uh, their uh, soothing music is played, um, thermostat set to a more comfortable temperature, um, or um, something like the good night command. Me, myself, um, I, I use a, a good night command at home. And once I'm, I'm in bed, uh, I'll tell my, my smart speaker to um, good night and it'll let me know the time. It'll set an alarm for the next morning. Let me know what's on my calendar for the next day. Um, make sure that the alarm is armed and make sure all the locks are locked and, and turn off my lights. Um, so just by saying good night, all that gets taken care of. And of course, these devices um, help in, in many, many ways. It's just a matter of how creative you are. Um, they um, help you communicate with the, with the outside world, of course, um, through, through smart displays and webcams and, and um, your smartphones. 
And you could use extra peripherals uh, however you see fit, depending on, on what your needs are or the client's needs are. <clears throat> and the probably the, the most important thing that, that I would like to point out is that these devices are not standardized, uh, which it would be very useful if they um, become standardized. So, so you have to be sure that you stay within one um, ecosystem. Um, so for example, um, the popular ecosystems today, the most popular are um, the Google Home, um, aka Google Chromecast um, or Google Assistant. Or, and the other set, of, set is um, Amazon products, um, the Amazon Echo, Amazon Alexa, Fire Sticks, and so on and so forth. Um, Ring doorbell is also part of Amazon. Um, when you buy into one of these ecosystems um, and you start buying peripherals, you have to make sure that the peripherals are compatible with the ecosystem that you have set up. And my suggestion is um, even prior to buying into one ecosystem, try to consider what you want to do and um, future plans also and do some research. Um, check on um, what products are out there, uh, what would fit your needs and, and which ones wouldn't fit, fit your needs. And then no, figure out uh, which ecosystem would support your needs um, um, most efficiently. And then buy into, an ecos then buy into a specific ecosystem and, and make sure that every time you buy a, another peripheral that is compatible with that ecosystem because you don't want to bring it home and then it's not compatible, which actually does happen often to many people. Um, so with that, um, I would like to uh, introduce um, Ken Smith, who's who is definitely an expert, and he'll he'll, he'll speak a little bit further. There we go. You can hear me better with the mute off. Um, <laughs> all right, I appreciate the uh, uh, opportunity to speak here today, and and uh, just um, want to hit on a, a couple quick things. Uh, and I think this was already mentioned earlier. I just um, my background actually is uh, pretty diverse. I've been an uh, insurance agent, engineer, a uh, bunch of different things. But when I landed in uh, this particular field of uh, support for uh, individuals with developmental disabilities, um, I found my true love. And, um, uh, and especially in the area of, of finding technology solutions, um, both assistive technology and something I'm going to be talking about here today at Remote Supports. And so I've been very active in the promotion of this particular type of service um, and because I've seen the benefits um, that have come from utilizing it. Uh, it's, it's pretty mind blowing when you start seeing lives change the way that I've seen um, just from the utilization of uh, some of the technology. So, <clears throat> um, so for those who aren't familiar, traditionally speaking, um, remote supports or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, support for persons with developmental disabilities, uh, the traditional way of supporting that is through direct supports. And that's either through like a nursing home type setting or ICFs, uh, residential centers, um, which would be, um, you can kind of picture like a nursing home for people with developmental disabilities, a large uh, multi-unit um, uh, living space with common areas. <clears throat> um, developmental centers as well. Um, for some of the more challenging situations. Uh, then also uh, more in the residential settings of group homes where you have, I'd say four to six, maybe eight people living in, a, um, in an apartment with a common area or just living independently um, with residential settings. And so the, the really unique and cool thing about what we're doing is, is this is a, we're starting to see a fundamental shift in the way um, supports are provided for people with developmental disabilities. Um, this being the traditional way. And the reason for that is these challenges that we're facing. Um, there just aren't enough people that want to do or have the, the right mindset or capacity um, to do direct supports for this special community. Uh, they're just like in, in many areas where we're having um, shortages uh, of uh, staffing, um, things that have occurred um, as, as a result of COVID and, and, uh, and so forth. The, we were already in this industry, we were already a crisis mode before COVID ever hit. 
um, now it's just, it's, um, it's extreme, uh, the need for the supports that we have and, and going the traditional route just isn't cutting it anymore. Um, it has not been for some time. <clears throat> the, um, uh, the other reason or other, other challenges, you know, people with, uh, developmental disabilities, just like us, they have a desire for independence. Um, just because they have some limitations, whether it's cognitively or cognitively or physically, does not mean that they don't have that strong desire that all of us have at one point in our lives where we said, you know what, it's time for me to to grow up and and time for me to um, to take chances and do do my own thing and make mistakes and learn from my mistakes and so forth and so on. Um, this population has not had a whole lot of opportunity to do that. And so the a, a challenge is, is that they want to, they desire that, and and yet they haven't had that opportunity. Um, next is just the cost of hiring and maintaining the direct support. When we can find them, um, we can't keep them. Or the cost of keeping them, they're, you know, when you're when you're offering them and, and only able because it's a Medicaid and in a lot of cases a Medicaid reimbursed service, the providers are only able to offer a, a, a certain amount of wage that may be depending on where they're at in the country, um, ten to fifteen dollars an hour. Well, they can go to work at McDonald's and not have to deal with wiping somebody's bottom or something like that. And so it's it's really really difficult. Just not not only finding them and keeping them, but just the cost of that whole process. Hiring somebody today just to have them go through the training process, show up for an hour of work, and then leave. And and that's not an exaggeration. This happens every single day, day in day out, with these provider agencies. They're really struggling, and and there's just other challenges that go right, right along with it. <clears throat> well, a solution, not the solution. But a solution is something we call remote supports. Um, so if you want to think of remote supports and understand it, you know, that we don't really have a lot of time to go into the details, but look at it as staff at a distance. This is still a human to human support service. It just is that the, the support person, the, the, the direct support person is now a remote support person. They're in a monitoring center somewhere providing that remote supports. And they're utilizing sensors and, and uh, cameras and, and different various items like that to help support that person, not for the person purpose of surveillance, but for the purpose of support. And we want to make sure that as people look at this service, that it's understood in a proper way. It is not a surveillance service. Nobody should be sitting there and watching everything somebody does through a camera, following them through the house. That's not what it is. What it, what it is is there's there's certain use cases that that the support team is concerned about and we want to make sure that we are aligned with those use cases and that we're not intruding on that person in other areas that that aren't one of the concerned use cases um, that have uh, that are trying to be met with that person's support um <clears throat> and, and we want to make sure also that the remote caregivers uh are able to respond to those needs and use cases so that is a solution well, why would you do remote supports? Well, this is going to sound really, really familiar to you. It's because direct support professionals are in short supply. Um, people with developmental disabilities want independence. And because the cost of hiring uh, direct support professionals is is just staggering. It, it just keeps going up and up because of the turnover rate and the, and the other forces that are um, that uh, like the work at a McDonald's and so forth, uh, the other wages that are going up, whereas this one's kind of locked in. So <clears throat> where can remote supports be provided? Um, and, and when I, when I'm saying this, I'm, I'm talking in the sense of whether it's a reimbursed service or not. Um, it's surprising the wide range of areas. So the kind of the go-to that everybody looks at remote supports is, how about those overnights where nothing ever happens? Um, this individual sits home, uh, uh, goes to bed, and then they have staff there that is sitting on the couch, in some cases sleeping on the couch. Um, and, uh, you know, what? what's the purpose of all that? It, it, does it make sense that somebody's there just in case something happens? And that is 
kind of the low hanging fruit of the service. But what was really surprising. So when I, when I first started about 10 years ago in this, in this business, um, I thought that the doorway was really, really narrow. This service will fit a very specific, narrow group of people. And outside of that, we really don't want to, we don't want to go beyond that. What I've actually found out is it's just the opposite is that the service actually fits really, really well for a huge breadth of people. And it's actually a very narrow group of individuals that it does not fit with. And I can't go into a bunch of scenarios and things like that. But um, if you think about high behavioral issues, uh, somebody who is um, easily taken advantage of, or somebody who elopes from the home, um, ho somebody who lashes out uh, physically at staff or refuses staff at the door, what they may be saying, and they are in a lot of cases, is I don't want somebody in my face all the time. Leave me alone. And when we put remote supports in place, all of those behavior issues vanish. It's just like magic. And it's a wonderful magic to see because we also see that uh, these individuals, a large percentage, about 14, 15, I'm sorry, 15 to 20 percent of those individuals, after a few years of remote supports, actually don't even need the remote supports anymore. They've become so independent that that all of the what ifs and all the concerns they've been able to dispel. <clears throat> um, so the challenge for remote supports, though, being adopted is first and foremost is the acceptance as a beneficial service. Um, there are several states that have adopted. I'm in Ohio. Uh, Ohio, I think, leads the nation in adoption of this service. Um, there are several other states that have it now under Medicaid waiver um, program as a reimbursed service. Uh, others allow the service, but it's not a reimbursed item. Um, but there's still a lot to learn, a lot of experience that people need to get in order to feel fully confident that the service is beneficial. I've seen it firsthand and I know how beneficial it is. And it's just a matter of spreading the word on uh, to that effect. But along with those lines is I'm one person and there's only so many vendors in the country. Um, I think that in Ohio, we have, uh, I think we have like 10 vendors that operate in Ohio at some capacity. Of those, only four of them operate outside of the state of Ohio. And so they're just, are in, and there's, there's Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Maine, um, uh, I, I forget the list, but there's just a huge list of new states that are coming on and adopting the service. So there's just not enough um, bandwidth within those regional or national carriers to pick up the demand that is happening. <clears throat> and then, so we may look at it and say, well, what if somebody just kind of did it on their own? And there have been agencies that have figured it out and done it on their own. Um, the problem is, is there's a huge startup cost to do that. And typically in this industry, there's not a high technology um, competency or uh, knowledge base, uh, not a whole lot of programmers working for provider agencies. Um, and so there's a huge learning curve, um, lots of mistakes you make on the way. Uh, I've been through it twice and, um, and, and learned a lot through the process of how not to do things and the right way to do things. Um, another hurdle is the regulatory process. Um, even in states that have adopted the service, um, there's still a lack of understanding um, as far as um, approving it as a service and then even understanding how the service works and, and when it's permissible and when it isn't. And oftentimes the people writing the rules on this don't really understand the service. And so they write rules that that kind of isolate the service from being able to be utilized in their state. And so it's just, it's part of the education. And that's the last point here is there's poor education. There's just not enough um, knowledge about the service um, and its uh, benefits. So um, that's what we're hoping to uh, um, take care of. So to deal with all of those hurdles that I was just talking about, or uh, several of those hurdles, um, myself and another um, person um, that have had uh, about 23 plus years experience as remote support vendors and providers is we decided, you know what, wouldn't it make more sense instead of us trying to, as just a couple of people trying to spread the news and, 
and spread the knowledge of this service, why don't we put this service in the hands of the local provider? Nobody understands the needs of that individual that's being served better than the local provider does. So why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we develop the software, the hardware, give them a knowledge base, um, provide for future development of services and the ongoing support. And so that's what Next Gen AT is, is a tool that, um, a, a SaaS tool along with some hardware where we provide everything that the local provider agency needs in order to become their own remote support vendor. And that way the support can be local. Um, we can we can ramp or, or scale the uh, adoption of the service at a more rapid pace than what it currently is. And we can spread the knowledge because there's more than just a couple of people spreading that knowledge. And so with that, <clears throat> that's all I had to say. Um, here's my contact information. If you wanted to get any more information uh, about NextGen, um, and I believe they're going to be sharing this slide. So I'll just go through these next couple of slides. Uh, here's some reference links to some of the information that was shared today. And, um, and lastly, uh, we're going to open it up to any questions. And the questions will be in the chat. So we did get a couple of questions while William was talking. Uh, William? I'll go ahead and turn your mic back on. Yep. First question was, you were talking about some of the devices. And the question was, if these devices are covered by access or ALTCS insurance at all. If you have any information on that. Uh, I don't have information on that right now. Um, I think Kang might know a little bit more than I do. Um, but I, I, I think it's specific to the device. Some, some devices are. Um, I definitely know some are, but um, I, I, I can't tell you that all of them are. Um, so it's kind of like a hit, hit and miss because there, there's hundreds and hundreds of devices out there. So you would have to check. Yeah. And, and, and to kind of jump on that is, is I, I'm not familiar with Arizona's rules or anything like that. I, I, I haven't seen any insurance carriers that necessarily that, that cover um, specifically the assistive tech type of devices. Um, here in Ohio, it is covered in our waiver as a reimbursed service for people that are on a waiver. But outside of that, I really can't, I don't have any knowledge. Do you know if uh, any of the access websites at all might have that information on those types of devices? Um, not off the top of my head because I'm, um, once again, I'm, <laughs> because I can't say I'm not aware of, of Arizona, but I, okay. but I, I, I wouldn't know. Okay. Um, the access, um, I was just going to say that you could use um, possibly home equity, uh, a home equity loan, and also because of I they use them for like stair climbers, home equity loans. Um, but um, also, Ohio in in their waiver they have technology first in their waiver. Can you go over that, Ken, a little bit? Yeah, so Ohio, um, a few years back, they um, they adopted language. Again, this is within the DD waiver um, that's called technology first. So the idea being that before we start throwing bodies at um, a problem, before we start putting staff in a home and, and so forth, that we need to uh, consider technology as a solution. Um, more recently, our, our current, well, actually our outgoing director, um, Jeff Davis, announced that they're taking that a step further and they're basically saying, no, you, you need to, it, it has to be ruled out completely as an option um, before we utilize um, direct supports or staffing support, just because uh, we've reached a point where there just aren't enough people to go around, as I mentioned earlier. So we had, and we had one other question, and Chris was able to put a, uh, an answer to it in the link, but the question was, any insights into HIPAA and related compliances for the smart devices? Again, this is when William was talking. Uh, we were able to put into the chat, there is a HIPAA final, uh, a PDF, it's a two-page uh, document that was put out by the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. If you scroll up in the chat feature, um, 
there's a PDF in there that you can download and it's two pages and it talks about HIPAA and telehealth, a stepwise guide to compliance and some other information to be aware of. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions that they would like to put into the chat for our speakers today? And again, today's program uh, is being recorded and when we are done, it will be uh, listed on our website and that link is in the chat feature as well. Uh, and you'll also be getting a, um, it'll pop up in your window for a survey. And if you would please go ahead and do the evaluation and the survey of today's webinar. And this is what helps guide us in bringing you future um, webinar series and information. Uh, you can let us know what, what you need to hear about. Again, so we can just give a couple more minutes here if we've got any more uh, questions, if anybody has. Or if you're having problems finding the download, uh, go ahead and, and put that message in there. We can figure out another way to get it to you, a PDF on the HIPAA and telehealth. It looks like we have a lot of questions coming in. Do you, um, Ken and William, do you have any um, uh, comments, any other comments or final thoughts for our group today? I just, I appreciate the opportunity and, and I'm hoping that um, Arizona uh, starts adopting this type of service. I haven't heard a whole lot of conversation out of the state, um, but I really like the way, the weather there. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm open to even, even if you have nothing to do with it, but you maybe have a friend that runs a provider agency, uh, you know, I'll, I'll make a sales call out there. It'd be great. Uh, I'll find a reason to do it, but uh yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, those of us in Tucson, we like the weather down here as well. <laughs> William? Uh, no, I just uh, wanted to thank everybody for, for um, attending the, the presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me at williamadina um, at verizon.net. Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with, with Ken as far as the, the weather and having an opportunity to go down there. So. <laughs> and Mary? Do you have any final thoughts for today? You're muted. Hi. Um, I just wanted to, I don't know, go, go over the group three and group two wheelchairs. Like group two wheelchairs, like they have captain seats and mm -hmm. they're called POVs, power operated vehicles. Um, uh, and include scooters, but um, the, the technical panel support doesn't, um, regard those as safe as the group three wheelchairs, which um, the group three wheelchairs have like 7.5 degree ramp. So like ADA is 4.5, 4.8, I think for the ramps. Um, and the 7.5 degrees is um, for if the person has balance issues or sensory impairments, um, then they, they really suggest that 7.5 degrees, you need that for going up and down ramps if you're doing it on a frequent basis. That, that, I just missed that in my, in my presentation. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. We've had a, quite a few comments that uh, they've appreciated, our, our participants have appreciated the information. Um, right. we, we have just a couple more minutes. If, uh, if either of you have anything else you'd like to say. No, I'm good. Okay. Um, William, you want to talk about um, your the reason you have smart home? Oh, um, yeah. Uh, actually, I, it's funny because I, I, I constantly forget to tell people. But um, I, I am visually impaired. Um, I, I have no usable frontal vision, um, only peripheral vision. And due to that, I'm unable to read text using my eyes. So I, I use tech, I'm a techie. So, um, I, I opt to use technology as the solution for all the obstacles that I face. Um, so my, all my devices talk, my, my phone, my computer, my watch, um, and I, I use smart devices all, all over the house um, for a lot of it just because it's fun. <laughs> uh, but it's definitely also very useful to me because I'm, I'm able to do certain things a lot faster and a lot easier because of the technology. Um, but um, 
Um, just so that everybody's aware, um, I I do this because I'm, I'm a techie, techie and I'm always looking for something that I could utilize at at, um, at work for, for our students. Um, but obviously, um, uh, a college atmosphere is not the same as your as your as a home. Um, when it comes to the home, um, Kang is definitely the expert. You know, he he does this as a business, um, so um, and he's successful at it. So, um, um, you have any questions? Um, he he probably could cover the technical side of things and and the um, what's appropriate and not appropriate. Me, on the other hand, I I could just cover um, all the options that are out there and and unique ways of pairing things together to, 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 to make them work and, and make them a little bit more fun. Appreciate that, William. Okay. Uh, again, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, please do the evaluation uh, at the end, which will pop up in a separate browser window for you uh, when we end the webinar. And I'd like to go ahead and wish everybody a happy holiday season. Mm -hmm. uh, enjoy, relax, and take care of you and your, yourself and your loved ones. And I think that uh, that'll be it then. Yep. Merry Christmas. Take care, Merry everybody. Christmas, everyone.